Good afternoon Good and afternoon. welcome everyone. We're gonna wait a couple more minutes just while people trickle in and then we will get started. Welcome, if you're just joining us, we are just letting folks trickle in and we will get started in just a minute. Feel free to turn your camera on as well. I know we have a lot of folks from the Terps Thrive community joining us, so um, if you feel comfortable, feel free to turn your video on. Awesome. Hi, Kate. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and get started and let people trickle in as they may. Um, my name is Ellie Garrity. I'm the manager of alumni career programs with the University of Maryland's Alumni Association. We're so excited you were able to join us today for our first ever Terps Thrive webinar, the Inside Scoop with Trish Paulvitz. Um, she will be giving us the insider's perspective on everything we need to know about resumes and interviewing skills. So thanks for joining us. A little bit about Trish. Trish, Trish has over 20 years of progressive human resources experience with building and driving complex HR strategies and programs across large global organizations such as Accenture, PricewaterCoopers, and more hands-on operational experience with smaller domestic companies, including not-for-profit organizations. She has broad and deep HR generalist experience that started in recruiting, and she's now the regional HR lead for a British railway consulting firm. I'm gonna let Trish go a little bit further into her professional background in just a bit, but before we get started, we're actually going to give you all a chance to know to get a chance to get to know each other through a quick breakout room moment. So I did say, if you'd like to turn on your video, now might be a great time. Um, I'm gonna split everyone into breakout rooms and ask you to introduce yourself, let folks know um, who you are, what year you graduated, maybe what your degree was, and then um, the hardest part about resume writing for you. So give me a brief moment, I'll break everyone into breakout groups and um, then you'll be off. Let's see, there we go. So in a moment, you should be um, heading off to your breakout rooms. We'll see you in a few minutes. So they, that, that get lumped in the problem uh, of all the things I've got to manage right now. And so that some of what might be happening at the moment, given the context, is naming the position of the problem. And of
So um, if you're still in this main room with us, feel free to join your breakout room. We're just doing brief introductions um, with everyone who's on this call. So feel free to join that breakout room. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome. We are um, all in breakout rooms introducing ourselves. So I'm going to assign you to a breakout room um, to get to know some of the other folks in this call. Um, and then we'll all join back together. I feel like it makes it easier for someone to understand uh, the growth you did when you quantify it. And I find that really hard to do with things that I've done. Just checking in to say two more minutes. We'll see you back there soon. Hi, Tanasha and Katie. We are just wrapping up our breakout rooms where everyone's getting a chance to get to know each other. So if you just okay. hang tight for a minute, um, I'm bringing everybody back in just a second. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Okay, everybody has 60 seconds, but if we wanna do a brief intro here, I'm happy to um, get to know you. Um, okay, how are hi, you? Hi, Katie, I'm good, how are you? Good, it's nice um, to meet you. I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late. I was in a meeting that ran over. No, that's, that's totally fine. I know it's a, a work day for most people, so it's great you can join us during hopefully your lunch break. Um, yeah. Looks like everybody's coming back from their, breakout sessions. I'll wait till um, our presenter comes back and then I'll, I'll hand it over to her. But folks were talking about um, what the hardest part about resume writing is for them. Do you have any initial thoughts? Um, yeah, sure, I'm sure everyone spoke in their breakout groups, but I think 
just getting the actual shell of it together would be the hardest part. And then kind of figuring out what exactly in each role or category um, of putting together different types of skill sets and making it sound um, the most professional, but also showing showing off your skills in the best way, I think would be the hardest part for me, at least. Yeah. Language, I guess, is short, the short version of that. Mm, language, and I heard skeleton, how to really set it up in a, in a way that makes sense, in a way that's digestible. Absolutely. Um, Great. Well, Trish, I'll hand it over to you if you want to hear from some of the folks about what they said their hardest um, part about writing a resume might be. And then if you want to get started on your presentation, um, take yeah. it away. Sure. I, um, I got a couple of good questions out of our own breakout, so we'll try to work those in. Um, but as I'm sharing the screen, are there any other, I guess, burning items anybody wanted to throw out there before I start launching into the, the deck itself? One of the um, things that I said on um, in my group is that I feel it's really hard for women to like be honest with what they've done and say, I've actually accomplished these things and not be modest about what they've accomplished. Um, and that's something that I think we just all have to learn that like you have to make it sound like you are awesome because you are <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, but it's hard. I think it's really hard. I think it's more hard. It's more difficult for women. Yeah, I actually do address that, the, the gender sort of differences in a couple of points in my, in my presentation. So we'll draw on that a little bit. Anything else? Um, for me, what other thing would be um, being what I call a late bloomer. So um, I actually am starting my career late in life because um, I had children and did the whole stay home mom thing. And then I went to school, got my degree and started my education. So how do I account for the fact that the first, I don't know, or should I say the last um, 14, 15 years I spent staying home, raising kids. Then I went and got my, my undergraduate degree. And now I'm entering the workforce um, without um, being looked at as someone who doesn't have value when in fact I have a lot of value of course. It, because being a stay-at-home mom and doing the whole PTA thing requires a lot of skills mm -hmm. so how do I put that yep. out there mm -hmm. on a resume um, so that people can see the value in who I am and not just the lack of degrees that I have behind my name. Okay yep that's good I do talk about that a little bit as well so we'll work that in and just maybe expand on uh, you know, if it's a specific case, right, that you're willing to put out there for yourself here for the group, we can talk about that a little bit more too. So, all right, let me go ahead and launch on this. Um, I think that most of you know, let me see, am I sharing? Can everybody see this? Yes. There yes. You go. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let me just uh, introduce myself a little bit. A lot of, uh, you know, what was read uh, by Ellie and also in the write-up itself. But, you know, we're all fellow Terrapins here. I was definitely the oldest on my breakout, but that's okay. Call that experienced. Uh, class of 90, was a political science major, an Italian minor. Um, I, I actually started out at Rutgers my first semester freshman year, and New Jersey didn't agree with me, so I transferred back to Maryland. Totally loved it. Uh, pledged a sorority, Cap Alpha Theta, and, you know, have just so many great years of experience and memories and happy to say you can see to the right my son is a junior going into his junior year this year at Maryland that is uh him to the right me the shrimp in the middle and then his friend he graduated high school with who goes to Ohio State and we drove out there for the Ohio State Maryland football game in November so that was a really good time nice, nice to be able to share this terrapin experience with my son um, but I am a working mom, definitely more than full time. Um, but, you know, I certainly have some skills and experience and background that I think could be of help. And when I offered that up in the reciprocity ring, I got several uh, hits of interest. And because I am working full time, I, I shared with Ellie and Milica that I might not be able to take everybody on one on one. So I offered to start with a group session first, just really sharing some insight, my best tips, uh, you know, for resume writing and a little bit about interviewing as well. But um, as Ellie said, I've been in HR for well over 20 years. I'm an old dog at this, uh, certainly a generalist, and started out as a recruiting assistant in executive recruiting for what was then Anderson Consulting. Um, became Accenture, uh, worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers, always in a generalist role, and um, you know, I've had varying uh, degrees of, of leadership and managing teams globally. 
um, you know, I've managed teams in India, Manila, Prague, uh, Buenos Aires, uh, London as well. And um, my most current job, I am working for a British railway consulting firm who has launched an arm here in North America. I mean, to be quite honest, I think our railway uh, infrastructure and, and services are woefully behind. So it's still a small company, but the opportunity is just amazing. So I get to be everything from hands-on to very strategic. Um, but in my 20 plus career, years career in HR, I have reviewed thousands of resumes and have conducted hundreds of interviews. So, um, you know, I really feel that I have that inside scoop to be able to offer and share with most of you. And it could be very time relevant given what's going on with the pandemic. A lot of people may find themselves in a position to be looking for a job and haven't had to do that, you know, or even work on a resume for years. Um, one of the, my most favorite things when I was with Accenture was that I was a corporate advisor with the undergrad business school at Maryland and really got to engage with the students and have resume writing workshops with them and run mock interview sessions, which was really, really helpful. Um, as the point above that, uh, behavioral interviewing expert, yep, I've been trained and have been doing behavioral or situational interviews for years. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that specifically. I live south of Annapolis and I do speak at the different public high schools here in Anne Arundel County covering things like professionalism, resume writing again, running mock interview sessions for the junior classes. And I also provide one-on-one -on -one coaching, right now mainly to family and friends, um, people that I've worked with, you know, haven't even worked with somebody directly since like 2006. And this one guy still calls me anytime he decides to make a career change for some advice. So um, what I'd also put in the reciprocity ring was that, I'm interested in potentially starting my own side business of offering consulting and coaching, but specifically to high school and college kids, um, helping them transition and sort of demystify the interviewing process, resume writing, and giving them that confidence to help them transition to whether it's going straight into the workforce out of high school or into college, or even, you know, for college students going into the working world. So I think that, you know, I can really help instill some confidence and give them a little leg up, you know, because things are so competitive. Gosh knows when I was in school, you know, it wasn't nearly as competitive. And I look at my kids now, uh, you know, my son's going in his junior year. I'm telling him, get that internship, get that good internship, you know, for this coming next summer. And my daughter's uh, going to be a freshman at Georgia Tech. So um, yeah, so interesting and very competitive times for them for sure. Uh, before I dig further into the deck, I thought we would take a quick poll here. Ellie's going to tee this up for us. And, you know, looking at the, um, the, the job market as it is right now with the economy, when was the last time you updated your resume? Was it within the last six to 12 months, maybe the last two to five years, over 10 years ago? Or are you in the what's a resume camp? No wrong answer. Just trying to get an assessment of this. <clears throat> and while that's a uh, teeing up, I think that, you know, it's, it's never, never, you know, too soon to look at your resume. In fact, as a personal practice, I look at mine every six months just to not so much update what I do, but to update any accomplishments. And we'll talk about how important that is and getting to, as I said in the write-up, you know, telling that best version of yourself on paper, because that paper is what's going to get you in the door. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. Great. Right. Yeah, it looks like folks, about 90% of folks have updated their resume within the last six to 12 mo months. And then we have a couple folks who say uh, in the last two to five years. Okay, well, that's good. I'm just curious for those that have done so in the last six to 12 months, is, is this anything prompted as a result of the pandemic? You don't need to say if, you know, whether or not you have had to look for a job, you know, not necessarily by choice, but is it is it anything that's kind of been impacted by the pandemic and, and the economy the way it is right now. You can just shout yes. that out. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's good no. to know. Anybody else? No. Internal promotion. Promotion. Okay. That's good. All right. So just kind of probably feeling like it's a good time to take a look at it anyway, right? For those that may not necessarily feel like they have to, it's a good time. And, that, and like I said, that's a good practice to get into. Okay. We'll move on to the next fly, slide. We can, I guess, are we done sharing the results? Okay, there we go. <clears throat> okay. All right. 
just starting with some of the basics on building your resume uh, format, of course, these things are important. And in our breakout, we talked about, you know, some people were under the impression that you should keep it to one page. My recommendation is no more than two. We'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, bullet points, not narrative, are always going to be your best bet. Uh, white space is good, particularly when hiring managers and recruiters are reading tons of resumes. Um, the basics, action words, simple tense. Proofread, 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 right? Everybody knows about that. And I have some stories on why you never want to rely solely on spell check because it will let you down at some point. Um, recommended order of content. You know, it is always good to start with a professional summary. Certifications are good to have at the top. I mean, you'll note if you notice on the title page, I had my, you know, Society for Human Resources certified professional after my name. You know, um, sometimes, you know, if, if people may not have years of experience, even having a certification makes a difference into how their resume is compared to others. Um, you know, it can be any professional certification. Uh, I will say that chronological is still what's typically expected. Um, you know, for those that have had some, I'll call them gap years for raising families or the other example that was brought up about, you know, maybe starting on your education and career later in life, you can use more of a competency or function style. So, you know, if you do have experience that you've gained, um, in this case, you might want to put your, your education at the top since it's more recent for you. Um, you know, I mean, at some point you will have to address those gap years. Often when you fill out an application, right, you've got to, that's definitely asking for chronological, but your resume is still what's going to get you in the door and looked at. Um, professional affiliations, memberships, those types of things are good, probably closer to the bottom, unless there's something that's more specifically tied to the organization, um, you know, that, that really speaks to the organization's mission. Maybe you are on the board for the March of Dimes, something like that. You know, maybe you volunteer, um, you know, uh, for a particular cause and you think that that would look favorably, that might be worth putting closer to the top. Um, and the biggest thing to talk about in a resume is differentiating yourself. Um, I'll get into this a little bit more on some slides because I do think this is where you're going to pick up how to tell the best version of yourself. But it is, it is, you know, you want to share the title and just a brief overview of role and responsibilities. Um, the key point about resumes is to highlight your results and contributions. Are you a leader versus a doer? What's your impact outside of your immediate role? Um, have you been published? Are there other noteworthy items? And you want to quantify where it's to your advantage. You know, what size team did you manage? Um, you know, the time or money that you saved, budget responsibility, percentage of improvement, those types of things. And we'll dig into that a little bit more. Um, I will say if there are questions, if you want to, I'll pause just at the end of each slide. So if there are any questions that you have, feel you have to get in now, um, I could be addressing it, at, you know, with a later slide or content, but I at least want to give that opportunity. Um, if, are there any questions before I move on immediately? Okay. Um, a little bit more about the basics. Um, you know, you want to be as concise and succinct as possible. I know it's hard to keep a resume to two pages when, like myself, you've got 20 plus years of experience. But I will also say, likewise, Kate brought this example up that, you know, if you've got somebody who's only got two years of experience, they sure as heck shouldn't be sending in a four page resume because, you know, that's fluff. Unless they've gone out and saved the world and, you know, solve world hunger, chances are they really don't have four pages worth of experience to be reading. So I would question that if you're a hiring manager yourself. Um, the point I made about proofreading, you know, you kind of get used to reading your own words, your own flow. So try reading it from right to left reading things in, you know, sort of in the opposite order. That's a good way to pick up misspellings um, and things that the spell check won't pick up, right? I don't want to hire a project manger. I want a project manager. So that won't be picked up. The manger won't be picked up in spell check. So, you know, good to have another set of eyes on it. That's always a good recommendation. And the piece about not being too narrative, I mean, bullets are good and that can show that you can convey, right, your skills, expertise, impact, all of that succinctly. Um, and white space is just easier on the eyes. So you shouldn't be filling up entire pages with narrative paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. Um, use the action verb, simple tenses, as I said, don't use responsible for, don't use was in charge of. That's a waste of space, quite frankly, when you know you've only got two pages to fit it in. 
Um, and I always recommend avoid using acronyms because even the well-known ones, they may vary from one industry to another. So it's good to spell it out maybe that first time and then use the parens to put the acronym after that spelled out version. And then you can use the acronym throughout the rest of the, the document if you need to. Um, I, I talked about this on the last slide, the order of the content. Good to start with that professional summary at the top. That, you, know, you want that to be the appetizer, right, for them to keep reading. Um, certifications, as I mentioned, can be very, uh, you know, helpful to being eye-catching up at the top. Chronological, pretty typical, competency-based, you know, this is where you want to group your best skills and experience on that front, front page. Um, irrespective of when you might have had that experience. Um, you know, so it kind of depends on the role you're going after and then your personal situation. Um, if you are older, like myself, mid, you know, middle age, uh, you should probably put your education at the bottom, um, unless it's a recent, uh, you know, um, degree, and you do not need to volunteer on your resume the year that you graduated. In fact, I recommend not doing this. Um, there is still a lot of unconscious bias out there, whether it's age, you know, sometimes gender, uh, you know, those types of things can still come into play. So you're not required to, you know, uh, volunteer that information up front. Any questions on this slide? Okay. So let's oh, dig Sorry, up. Trish, we got a quick question. Sure, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, didn't want to miss this one. Um, is there a standard for how long a bullet point should be? I know you mentioned um, <clears throat> there should be some white space and that's easier on the eyes, but if you're trying to fit in a lot of information in a bullet point, how long should that be? Well, I mean, a bullet point shouldn't be another narrative with just a bullet in front of it. I mean, you still, the, the point is to get your information across as succinctly as possible. So what, we'll show, what I'll show you are some examples. These are actual examples of resumes of people that I've worked with. Um, this first one here, this was the original that came to me and this person was you know, looking for a director level opportunity. So again, you don't wanna waste space. Um, do not bother with any type of objective statement. Uh, you know, I've only ever seen this really required for like high school students working on a resume as part of an exercise, but it's kind of awkward if you've got a director level person who is seeking a challenging position in an analytical and operational field. You know, this, this is your chance to go ahead and put the, the eye-catching stuff, that appetizer statement up front. Um, and you know, the bullets, these, this is an example of bullets that I actually don't agree with. You know, these bullets of the areas of expertise that you can see here, these are just buzzwords. How do I know that you have this experience? And to me, this is a waste of space. Um, what you should do is work those bullets into examples below of how you have demonstrated success or impact using change management skills. Well, how, what have you done with the systems you know, analysis experience that you have? Tell me how the process improvement made a difference, right? So this is an original, as I said right here, this is what it looked like before we started working together. This is more what it looked like after the fact. You can see it's a short summary at the top. The, you know, I'll call it that leadership summary at the top for this person. Um, the professional experience, um, what you'll notice, you know, instead of that objective statement, there's the appetizer and then the, those bullets, those really just plain buzzwords that I don't know yet if the person's really done it, um, were, are worked into more of the examples of these bullets that you'll see below. So one thing that's good to do that where I just have the generic insurance company as the company name, a very one sentence, maybe max two sentences to explain what the organization is, especially if it's not a typical brand, you know, household type name like Coca-Cola, Microsoft, you know, even Accenture, PricewaterhouseCoopers, you know, pretty well known names in their industries. So it's good to put just a very brief explanation of, you know, the organization, what they do. Um, and this is what I mean underneath the title that, you know, lead a team of 15 to manage track. This, this is the bit for the job description, the general job description. And then this person goes right into the bullets represent the impact, the contributions, the results, and even highlight um, some leadership specifics. 
So you'll see establish the data metrics and reporting analysis, created detailed process flows. This is what this person did, right? And I'll talk a little bit more why, why this is so important on the next slide. But you'll see achieved significant year-on-year -year improvement of personal leadership index scores, 43%. That is a huge highlight. That is a huge difference. And that you know, shows the leadership impact that this particular individual has, right? Um, you know, selected as a founding member of Focus DC, which was a diversity and inclusion committee. So you know, this highlights the person, not just the day-to-day -day job that they did. So I think, let me go to this next example just to show you um, the difference as well. Um, this is the biggest mistake that people make, I think, on their resumes. Their resumes read too much like a job description. You don't want your resume to read like the job description that's actually been posted, right, or the job posting that's out there. You want the hiring manager or the recruiter to really be able to get from reading, hopefully what's just a two-page resume, really getting a sense of, who they'd be hiring in you, what you're capable of, the kind of results you're able to get. So, you know, if you read these bullets here, manage all phases of litigation, draft legal documents, and again, this is an actual resume that I got, this is the original version, evaluate settlement negotiations, prepare attorney for weekly probate proceedings, perform legal secretary duties, responsible for business development, right? This reads like a job description. And this is very generic. And this, this is, I think, a lost opportunity for any of us um, because you don't want it to read just like everybody else's. They want to know what are they getting when they hire you. So shamefully sell yourself. This kind of speaks to the point that was brought up earlier about women not always being comfortable tooting their own horn. And I have certainly coached and mentored a lot of women over my career, you know, from an HR perspective internally and even externally, men do this all the time. They promote themselves shamelessly. When there is an opportunity that comes up even internally, a guy will, you know, hold up his hand, absolutely jump for it, jump for it. And women tend to be a little more thoughtful. I mean, this is not, a, not, not meant to be a sexist statement, but many women that I've seen tend to be the type to just work hard, keep their head down, and somebody will notice. Not always the case, and especially when things are more and more competitive. So you have to be comfortable jotting down your accomplishments, speaking up for the difference that you make. Um, quite frankly, I think our strength as women is a differentiator in and of itself, especially in these times right now, uh, you know, with the pandemic and as crazy as things are, empathy is somewhat you know, easier, comes more easily to women. And I'm finding that you know, my HR skills and being able to connect with people, I've got weekly calls with people who are feeling very distressed about this situation. You know, and I'm willing to connect with them and able to connect with them and just to kind of help them through these difficult times. Um, you know, women can be very intuitive in certain situations. I'm not saying that men cannot be, but you know, we also need to be just as progressive as men in selling ourselves and tooting our own horn right as, as the saying goes so here you have to be able to highlight you know the contributions and impact that you made so as you're sitting down looking at your resume trying to get to this differentiated version of yourself on paper I always recommend to people think about it from a cause and effect perspective because I was in this role because of what I did here was the outcome right so because I'm great at connecting with clients I was able to affect a 97 percent retention rate over the course of my tenure that's that last bullet you see right there um, you know because of what I did and how thorough and efficient I am I ensured more favorable settlement packages for 100% of the clients. But you can see, this is also an example of how quantifying where you can makes a difference as well. You know, lots of senior executives, management, they like data and numbers speak volumes for the story that you're telling about yourself. So, you know, you want to be able to get across, you know, whether it was a number of the size of the team you managed, um, you know, if it was an amount of money that you saved, you know, on a particular project that was overrun, how you brought that back, um, you know, but looking at these bullet points here, again, this is sort of a similar format. You've got the very brief, you know, one paragraph type job description, general job description of the role itself for that title, and then you go right into the bullets that differentiate 
what this person brought to the table in this role. And I can get a much better idea from reading this, okay, this is how, you know, it's, it's going to, um, this, is, this is what will make a difference, right? Um, this is what the, the person can bring when they come in the door, should I hire this person on my team? It's a lot easier to see that from this than from that. Right, this is very generic, reads like a job description. And this one really speaks more to what the individual did, what they accomplished. Let me stop there, see if there are any quick questions, anything anybody wants to throw in. <clears throat> Let's give folks a second to chat in any questions they have. Um, Trish, this is while we're waiting, this is the first time I've seen um, kind of personally that paragraph that's underneath the, I think that's what you're calling the appetizer. Could you talk more about um, what that paragraph does and, you know, from your experience, what do you usually pull out of that paragraph? Yeah, yeah actually this paragraph on this slide is more the brief job description tied to this title. But if we go to this example, this operations leader, this would be at the very top. So what I have on the top of my resume is human resources leader, right? And then you think about this as your mini elevator speech on paper. And for those of you that have a LinkedIn profile, right? And I hope all of you do, that is going to be that under that profile, that mini paragraph. And I know there's a maximum character limit there. That's similar to what that is. So you want somebody to get the highlight of who you are, your expertise, what you do. That's that appetizer opening, um, you know, opening course, if you will, of that, that paragraph. So this one's pretty short here, um, but that's what I'm talking about by the appetizer paragraph. You know, give them the highlights of who you are, what you do, your expertise, um, you know, and then the paragraphs that on this particular slide, this is that brief job description. So this is already like maybe somebody's first or second job experience, <clears throat> that paragraph under senior paralegal and office administrator, that's all they have for the job description piece of it. So it's not going to be these multiple bullets, which really just read like a job description. It's the general job description in the paragraph, followed by the bullets of the actual accomplishments, impact, and results that this individual made in that job. Great, thank you. We got a couple of questions that came sure. in about <clears throat> quantifying tasks. Um, do you have any just general tips on how to quantify your tasks? We have a couple different questions about um, how to quantify when money was not saved or you don't lead a team or um, how to quantify soft skills. Mm, you may not be able to quantify everything. I mean, we can just start there. Um, you know, when I meet with people on their resumes, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty intensive and iterative process because I will, I will interview them, tell me more about your job, explain to me more, right? So if I go back to this one, you know, manage all phases of litigation. Okay, talk to me more about what that really means. And I, you know, can usually help people pull out the pieces that can be quantified, um, but you know, soft skills may not be, but also soft skills, you may be able to use your soft skills to be able to turn around, um, you know, an undertapped market for example, um, you know, if you're really good at connecting with the clients and building that kind of rapport and trust, right, that the, you, they will come and either, for example, buy right from your company, just as an example, buy from your company because you made that difference because you made that relationship stronger and, you know, maybe gave them the confidence and trust in the company to get more actively involved with purchasing products or services. So, not every soft skill can be quantified. Not every task can be quantified. It really depends on what it is. But, you know, you want to think about it again, think about it from a cause and effect perspective. Because of this, I saved X money. Now, of course, where quantifying doesn't work to your advantage, maybe you are a project manager on an overrun project, over budget, over time, that would not be something you would want to highlight by quantifying. So, you know, not, not quantifying is not always going to work to your advantage, which is why I said definitely use it when it's to your advantage and when you're trying to convey the results and, you know, impact that you made. So again, it's, you know, when I work with people, it's a very intensive process to get to the bottom and usually coming out of that, they're like, wow, you know, you make me sound like a rock star. I'm like, no, you're the rock star. You just have to be able to tell that story, that version of yourself more succinctly and effectively on paper. So 
Right. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a skill that we're all trying to learn. (laughs) It is. And it it is not something that comes easily to people. And like I said, I mean, you know, I've just been doing this for years, but you know, if, um, even though I am working full time, you know, if there are questions that people want to ask specifically, you know, give, give me a call or send me an email. Maybe we can set up some time. I'm hoping that this presentation will give people some general things to start with first on your own. And, you know, then we can possibly think about if needed, you know, going one on one. But yeah, these things take time. Um, and, it, and it's not always easy. And when you're not, if you're not good about tooting your own horn to begin with, it can be a little bit uncomfortable at first too. But usually people feel really good about the, the outcome when, when, they, when somebody sees them. Because you're never going to see yourself the way other people do. But that's where the interview process comes in to pull those things out of you. Right. Absolutely. Well, we do have a couple specific questions um, that maybe you could touch on later mm-hmm. regarding format. So we had some folks that are either in research or academia and then um, another person asking about military personnel, how do you restructure your resume? So if you'd like to talk about that now, that'd be great. Or if you want to hold that to the end, it's up to you. Let's hold that to the end because those are longer, longer, you know, responses. And, you know, even if we can't get to those questions, because I see we're already almost a quarter of here, even if we can't get to those questions now, you know, I'll take those questions offline and can respond to the group you know, or send out a group email if, if that would help too. Great, thank you. So I'm happy to offer that. Um, I, I think we've covered a little bit, you know, enough on the quantifying piece, but on this slide you can see, right, the difference. The left side, eh, yeah, it's fine. It's, it's words, but the right side really speaks more specifically to the individual. So that's just the point of this slide. Um, I'm gonna keep moving because I do wanna get to the interview tip piece of it. Um, but I often get the question, what can you do in advance of an interview? Most people know, and most people will research on their own about the organization and if possible, the opportunity itself. You always want to check your network for who you may know, who you're connected with on LinkedIn, whether it's a direct contact to an organization or somebody who might know about the organization. Um, I always recommend practicing that elevator speech. Um, I've seen a lot of interviewers when they get into an interview, chances are they really haven't looked over your resume enough. And so you'll get the, so tell me a little bit about yourself, right? First thing when you sit down, that's their way of buying time because then you'll see them flipping through your resume, reading through it real quickly. So you wanna be prepared to get that across because you'll likely be asked that question. Uh, And this is an important one. You wanna have go-to examples of situations that highlight your best, particularly if it was a tough situation that got turned around. And you want to prepare good, thoughtful questions for the interviewer and ask them, especially when they say, do you have any questions for me? Please don't say, no, I'm good, thanks. No, I think I got what I need. Nope, I think, I mean, you should definitely take advantage. Ask questions, even if it's a generic question, because it at least shows a different level of interest in the organization. Unless, of course, through the interview, you've realized you're generally generally not interested or genuinely not interested, then you can exit that interview as quickly as possible. Basic here, always plan to arrive early. Doesn't matter if you're sitting in the parking garage for a while or in a coffee shop around the corner, you just never wanna be late. And again, be able to, tr- to articulate what differentiates you because you your resume was awesome. Now you're in the door, you've gotta be able to give that great interview too. Various types of interviews. If it's been a while since you interviewed, you know, there's informational types. This is typically done by the recruiter or somebody on the hiring team just to kind of get some general information from you and share some general information. Skills assessment, assessments are usually done by somebody more technical, somebody in the role. Uh, there could be technical type tests as well. Panel interviews, you've got, feels like the Inquisition, multiple interviewers on one interviewee. Video interviews, this has become a lot more commonplace now with the pandemic. A lot of companies are using video interviews just like with the artificial, and and a lot of them have an artificial intelligence premise to it. These are, this is interesting, and uh, there was a recent study done um, where video interviews, um, companies have been sued uh, because these 
the, the algorithms are still written by people and where there is an opportunity for unconscious bias, again, not, not intentional, but unconscious bias could still be written into those algorithms. And there was um, a kid who was coming out of college who had excellent test scores, you know, the, the standardized test scores and had done well in college, but did not pass any of the six companies, different companies interview, uh, video interviews that he did. Turns out the, the student coming out of college was bipolar and the algorithm rejected facial expressions that were not necessarily typical of somebody who might not be bipolar. Well, sadly for the companies, that student's dad also happened to be a class action litigator. So they disclosed with six different companies for, um, sorry, an undisclosed amount of money uh, settled with those companies. So I personally am not a big fan of uh, the artificial intelligence. You always have to have that human factor just for reasons such as that. So you could just kind of take those for what they're worth. Um, behavioral or situational interviews. This is the one that really I think people get most nervous about and often what trips people up the most. So while you want to be prepared for any and all of these types of interviews, I will spend the next slide talking a little bit more about the behavioral or situational interviews. <clears throat> And so the premise to these types of interviews, really based on success factors. Uh, when I started out with Anderson Consulting, you know, we looked at, we had a, a whole team of psychologists look at the most successful partners in the firm. And they wanted to figure out what is it that makes them so successful, hence success factors. And after doing all of that analysis and, you know, assessment and interviewing, the success factors they came up with, they also came up with an entire battery of questions to be able to dig into interviews and probe people to figure out do you have those success factors? Or if you're coming off of campus, do you possess the potential and capability for those success factors? So these are very specifically designed questions to get at whether or not somebody has those same success factors that a company deems necessary for success in that organization. And really the, bat, the best indicator of how somebody will act or you know, um, impact a situation is how they've already dealt with a similar situation. So, you know, the hypothetical questions, I don't put a lot of stock in those because anybody can make anything up, right? Um, so the past in, past action is the best indicator of, of future, future um, decisions and actions. And the important thing about this, these types of interviews, they're all about you. And this is where women also get, get caught up in, you want to come across as a team player, right? But, and they use a lot of we and us. And an interviewer like myself, will get to the specifics of what did you do? What did you say? We have probing questions to follow up and dig into that. And you know, you need to get comfortable with the fact that it is perfectly okay to say I and me, because they're not gonna be hiring your team. They're gonna be hiring you. You want them to hire you. So you have to speak specifically to things that you did, things you said, how you felt. You'll get that question, right? Well, how did you feel about that? Like, you know, these are, these are, things that you'll hear if you haven't been through many situational or behavioral interviews. Um, you want to be prepared with solid examples of stories or situations, even if you think they might put you in a bad light, like maybe it didn't turn out as positively or the way you wanted. Those are often the situations where companies want to see what did you learn from that? How did you, how did you, you know, rise from that, so to speak? Um, and you also want to have plenty of examples to draw from. Amazon is well known, uh, at least in the HR space, well known for their situational interviews where they may ask you the same question, but they will ask you for three different examples to get to the answer and get some insight to your success factors and evidence of meeting, meeting the bar for what they have. So you want to have plenty of examples that you can draw fun from, but you certainly don't want to be too rehearsed because that won't come across right as natural or genuine. Um, and the biggest thing for these types of interviews, don't try to finesse or fake an example. Don't think of an interesting work experience that your teammate might have had or a peer might have had because a good interview will be able to trip you up with those probing questions. And it, you know, it's pretty easy to spot um, you know, when somebody is, is not drawing from actual experiences. So stick to what you know best and that's you. All right, so let's say it's showtime, you're in the interview. Some of these are, are pretty basic, but I always think it's worth mentioning. Um, you know, as far as the interaction, 
you know, you got to have a firm handshake. If, if, you, if you're not sure if you've got a firm handshake, honestly, it might not be. Um, I always get a little inside chuckle when I shake a man's hand and he's got to like give me that second squeeze because my handshake's a little bit better than his, stronger than his. They're like, whoa, okay. So, but you know, you don't want to like be crushing or anything like that, but you want to have a firm, solid handshake. It's amazing how, how much people remember that. Um, as you're in the interview, appropriate eye contact is what I always recommend. You don't want to stare. It can be a little uncomfortable. And, you know, oftentimes people, I recommend maintaining more consistent eye contact when the interviewer is speaking. But when you are giving your answer, it's okay to look away once in a while, you know, just not that constant. You don't want to be talking to them and giving them your entire answer the whole time without breaking eye contact or even blinking because it's going to come across as a little odd, just like what this probably looks like right now, right? Um, listening without bias, this, and this goes to the engaged and attentive as well. Make sure you actually hear the question being asked. Hear the interviewer out totally. Oftentimes, people are already thinking about their response before they've heard the actual questions. And I find that when I'm asking a question, I know when somebody hasn't actually fully heard the question that I was offering because they start talking in circles and they don't actually land the point and don't get to answering the actual question that I ask. So it helps if you actually listen openly, hear what they're saying till the end of the question. And Remembering names, I know that this is a challenge for most people, but it really can help if you are just good at remembering names. It just makes such a difference for yourself. Um, appearance, basic things here, but it's amazing what people forget if it's been a while. You wanna be remembered for what you said, what you shared, your skills and impact, not your fashion choices, not your personal hygiene, um, anything that could be distracting as far as makeup and nails. Yes, you want to be able to express your individual style, but you don't want them in, in the war room, in the debrief session, talking about the woman who had bright neon green nails. You want them talking about the woman that drove that $250 million budget and saved X, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You want them to remember the experience and skills and impact that you're capable of, not what you wore, not what you look like even. Um, and I never recommend perfume for these things because your interviewer could have allergies. Um, it could be overwhelming. Everybody's got a different, you know, different style um, and preference when it comes to things like cologne and perfume. But, you know, in that, that famous quote by Will Rogers, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So you want them to remember what you're capable of and what you can do, not how you looked or how you smelled. Basic interviewing do's and don'ts. Um, I recommend, this is a big one for me, that first one, be courteous to anyone you meet. Doesn't matter if it's a security guard in the lobby, doesn't matter if it's maybe the partner's uh, you know, executive assistant, doesn't matter because they will ask, I have asked even the security guard, so what'd you think of that guy? You know, just to kind of get that impression. If they say, oh, they were rude and condescending, if I've got two people side by side that seem pretty equal, that kind of thing can make a difference for me as to who I'm going to invite back for a next round. Um, on the don't side, obviously it goes without saying, don't take any calls or texts. I would just recommend turning your phone off because you don't even want to hear that buzzing in your purse um, and be distracted by that or break your stride when you're giving a really good interview, right? Um, on the do side, bring extra copies of your resume, be prepared with reference. Should they, should they ask? A lot of people put references available upon request. On the don't side, just don't talk negatively about anything or anyone because that really only puts you in a bad light. And, and even with the pandemic, things that might seem, you know, so generic, right, and, and, and benign, you, you just don't want to come across as being negative about anything. Um, again, take a few seconds to think about your answers before you give them. You can even ask to have the question repeated. Sometimes that buys you a little more time to formulate the question in your mind. Um, because you, you want to be able to make sure that you answer the actual question and not, as it says to the right, talk in circles or feel the need to fill the silence. Um, I, I have to admit, I'm one of those people when presenters are up and they start giving off too many ums and uhs, I get distracted. It's a weakness of mine. I find that I start doing hash marks for how many times they've said uhs and ums. I've already lost interest and in not no longer paying attention to what they're saying. So it's okay to have general silence between questions and answers. It's okay. You don't have to fill the air. Make sure, again, answer the actual questions asked and do so succinctly. Don't feel the need to carry on and run on. If you've answered the question, you've answered the question. Then you just stop talking. Don't initiate any conversations about money. 
let the company or the recruiter bring that up first. You never want to talk about salary, bonuses, things like that. You certainly don't want to come across as being presumptuous. Ask good questions and, you know, to show that you did your research about the organization and that you are seriously interested. And I do share, I think on the next slide, some recommended questions that I use, uh, you know, that are kind of beyond the norm, the typical questions that people tend to ask. And then you never want to share or ask anything personal or private, whether of the interviewer, and you don't want to offer that information about yourself. Sounds old fashioned, this next one, send a thank you note within a week. Email's okay, but honestly, written notes still leave a lasting impression if you can get the address. And then that last point I already talked about, don't use fake answers or experiences because good interviewers are trained to spot the BS. So stick to what you know best, and that's you. Nobody knows you better like you, right? Nobody knows you better than you. Okay, these are some examples of questions for interviewers. I broke it down into three sections. General, what do you believe is the biggest differentiator for anyone considering a role at this company? I offer this as a means of remembering that you're not the only one being interviewed. You're interviewing them as well as to whether or not an opportunity is a fit for you. Maybe you've read on the website the mission, the, you know, the values, et cetera. Maybe those things spoke to you, but you still will need to get a good feel as to whether or not this place is right for you and if this is a place you would like to spend some time in a, you know, for your career, because we do spend a lot of time during the day working, of course. So is that is that a place you really wanna be? Um, what are some of the key goals or metrics for this role or the department? Some specific to the interviewer, what do you see as the top one to three capabilities or characteristics that are must-haves for the person you hire into this role? Note the person you hire into this role, you want to, again, not be too presumptuous and put yourself in that question, right? What would you, the one top to three capabilities or characteristics you would want of me? You don't want to be that presumptuous. And this is kind of a good way to get at somebody's leadership style. Do you mentor protégés? If so, how would you describe your mentoring style? Could give you some insight if this person would be the person that you would be working for. My, of course, most favorite topic as an HR professional, diversity and inclusion. Whether or not it's been a formal part of my HR role, as I've always made diversity and inclusion a, a part of what I do and a part of what I'm involved with. So I personally want to know these types of things. Um, you know, how does diversity and inclusion fit into the day-to-day -day business operations? Is there an opportunity for the person in this role to get directly involved with diversity and inclusion efforts? Uh, you know, this is something that's important to me, and I want to know that it's important to any company that I might be considering, and I would like to hear the interviewers address that topic. So, okay, I'm going to stop there. I know we're at the top of the hour, so just some time maybe from, for some general questions, but again, I'm willing to take any written questions from the chat or anything else and can help respond to those offline, uh, happy to share and um, you know, also offer up my email address at the end here on the next slide if anybody wants to reach out to me directly if there wasn't perhaps something you were comfortable with sharing. So let me stop there. Questions, how can I help? Great. So we did have some questions come in. And first of all, thank you, Trish, so much for sharing your expertise with this group. I learned a lot myself. And I'm hoping if you feel comfortable that I could send out the slideshow that you went through today, just in case people wanted to look back on some of the things yeah. you mentioned and, you know, specifically those questions you had for interviewers, I think yep. are fabulous. That would Absolutely. be great to refer back to. So just so everyone knows, I'll send out a recording of this webinar and the slideshow with Trish's email attached. So you can reach out to her that way. Um, but we only have a couple minutes. So we did have one question come in about um, taking notes during interviews. I think you covered so many great things that you should be doing during interviews. And I was wondering if you had thoughts on um, just taking notes in general, how many notes should you take, et cetera? Sure. I mean, I always recommend just having, you know, a small pad of paper or something like that, a mini notebook or a single sheet of paper, just in case there are specifics you want to jot down. But I do recommend do not take a lot of notes. This is an interview. This is meant to be a discussion and interactive, you know, more of a verbal sense. And you, you don't want to necessarily be remembered for taking copious notes. You want to be engaged. And often people think when you're writing something down, you're not really paying attention. So, you know, some people use are, are big notes takers. I tend to be at work, but not in an interview. So keep it, keep it to a minimal. 
you know, some things very specifically. Maybe it's an article somebody recommends. Maybe it's a name you want to look up, something like that. But you don't want to take down their responses, you know, to a bunch of things. And hopefully you've done your homework anyway and, you know, know a lot about the, the opportunity in the organization that you're considering that you're in the interview for. Great, thank you for addressing that. And thanks everyone for all your thoughtful questions. I know we don't have time to get to all of them, but as Trish mentioned, she's happy to answer some of those offline. Um, we are gonna end now. So thank, every, thank you everyone for joining us. It was a pleasure to meet um, virtually some of you that are in the Terps Thrive program, and we hope to do more events like this. So please let me know if you have any ideas or you wanna share some of your expertise as well with the rest of the Terps Thrive community. Um, Trisha's email is here. And again, I'll follow up with all of the stuff you'll need to um, look back on all this great content. But thanks again, Trish. Thanks, everyone. And of course, go Terps. Have yep. a good rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. See ya.